So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here in the middle of the day in this, at this workshop. My name is Alexia. I'm an artist and I'm also a PhD fellow here at Science. And um, this playtesting of this game that we're going to do today is part of my PhD studies, as I mentioned earlier. And you are the first official playtesting group, so congratulations. Um, the, this game is still under development, so I'm expecting to make changes after today based on your feedback as well. So treat this as a prototype still at this stage. So uh, this is a study of how I'm a game as opposed to academic work can raise uh, awareness about AI. And so I'll have a survey for you later at the end of the game. Uh, and I would really appreciate it if you can fill it. So this is an artist game. And by artist game, I mean a board game, but with an artistic intent. So on one hand, it aims to raise awareness about AI, power dynamics, its impact on society in a playful way but it's also going to be a standalone artwork. And it's important that there are many of us uh, playing this game and receiving feedback because I shouldn't be talking on behalf of the whole Cypriot society about AI. So it's important to have you know, people um, sharing their opinions as well and their experiences. Um, yeah, so I was wondering what, what is your, um, welcome. Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> so what is your experience with AI? Do you work with it? Are you interested in it? Um, I'd like to hear about from you as well. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I would say my experience is none beyond the ordinary human, so yeah. I've heard about AI, I know about AI, I know about you know. It's all in my academic work, unfortunately, my professors mention it a lot. And I don't say, I say unfortunately only because of the scope that is being brushed by the professors, because they mention it at a very basic level. So I think this is something that really would help me kind of get in depth, because it really affects our life a lot more than we expect it to sometimes, I think. Okay, cool, yeah, absolutely. So I'm using AI in the most fundamental ways <laughs> in my work. So it, essentially to mimic basic human response, so just drafting emails, drafting uh, uh, work proposals, things like that. But it's also in the way that I use it, it's, it's become very apparent how many people do use it in my line of work because mm -hmm. any prompts that I generated, it's also very easy to see others using the similar prompts to produce the same results. All right, so okay. You can see how far reaching it is. Yeah. Interesting. but mostly for um, social ideas and for like mood boards and stuff like that, not really the developing for product demonstration. Um, I'd say I'm an active antagonist against AI. <laughs> um, the general smoothing out of thought processes that you are describing worries me. I, however, do use it. Uh, it has massively improved my workflow. I'm a photographer, so whereas something might have taken an hour to remove in Photoshop, I now can just circle it and say background, and it's done for me. Mm. That's fine. Um, yeah, but mostly I think we're re-entering the dark ages voluntarily. So uh, yeah, I don't like it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Would you like to share? Okay. Great. So, um, okay. So we all have some kind of uh, relationship with AI uh, in some ways, part of our everyday lives. Oops. Yeah. So this is what we're going to do today. I'll give a brief 30 minute presentation more about the concept of this game and what I mean by AI colonialism, just to make sure we're all on the same page before we start playing. And then um, the rest of the time, we can go ahead and play the AI colonialism board game, Cyprus version. Um, so you've all mentioned 
a few things, a few AI systems that you interact with uh, in your everyday life. Uh, so here's just a few other uh, things that we, we use AI even not, not always realizing we use AI technologies. So from streaming suggestions, Netflix suggesting to us what to watch based on our previous uh, what, uh, films and series that we've watched on that platform. Machine translation, so Google translates, uses AI that learns over time by our prompts to create better, more natural translations. Um, also, which friends post you'll see first on social media. Uh, Facebook uh, famously uses this algorithm but doesn't really share how these decisions are made. Um, targeted ads, so you know, if we ever get all these ads and think, how, how on earth did they know that this is relevant to me? Um, so Google collects all the data, for example, from our online behavior, from our search, what, what time we search for things, what websites we go to after our search, what we search after that, and it analyzes our behavior and categorizes into these certain categories that uh, Google has. Then uh, recognizing faces when we're tagging friends on posts, map directions, so Google Translate uh, uses our location data to analyze the traffic conditions, and then it uses that data to predict future traffic as well. Uh, internet search, it's pretty much everywhere. It's part of our everyday life. So we can agree on that. I'm gonna go ahead with a super simplified intro to AI. Please bear with me if this is really basic, but I think it's good that we're all kind of know more or less uh, the same things before we start playing. And this is coming from an artist. I'm not an, uh, a computer person, so this is gonna be an artist's explanation of what AI is. So why has it exploded this past few years, AI? We've had huge advances in computing power. We've had an explosion of data availability in digital form and improvements in algorithms. And as a result, AI is able to analyze huge amounts of data that normally it would take humans forever, if not, it might not even be realistic for humans to analyze it, but AI is able to do it very fast. So how does it work? Whereas in traditional programming, uh, we would write these very explicit instructions that tell the computer what to do, and the computer would execute these instructions to solve a very specific problem. On the other hand, AI and machine learning specifically, uh, they're trained on a large amount of data, and they analyze this data, they identify patterns, and then they're able to make predictions or decisions based on that analysis. As an example, if I wanted to generate images of cats, I would need thousands and thousands of images of cats that I would use as training data to train an AI model. And during this training process, the system would undertake statistical analysis of the data, identify various patterns, and then be able to generate afterwards images, photorealistic images of cats. However, these are synthetic images. They're not real cats. They're purely based on the input data, the training data that we've given the model to be trained on. And so these predictions and the outputs that the AI generates are completely based on the data that it is trained on. So for example, that AI cat generator would not be able to generate images of dogs because it has not been fed any images of dogs. Um, and as with any technology, AI is a very human creation. It does not exist in a vacuum but it reflects the society that produces it. Uh, it reflects the values, the prejudice, the biases, the culture uh, of that society. 
But despite of that, it's marketed as a universal, objective, and global technology. Um, and that's where power dynamics and the term AI colonialism comes in. Mm, where's my mouse? Ah, oh, it doesn't show it here. Uh, okay. All right. So power in AI is not equally distributed globally. And by power, I mean who creates these technologies, who has a say in them, who benefits the most out of them, but also who is left out of these technologies. AI is a very expensive technology. Uh, it requires huge amounts of data, resources, monetary investments, and skill sets to develop and to operate this technology. And because of that, because only a few countries, a few institutions are able to afford all these, there are huge differences between um, the development of AI technologies. So for example, you can see in 2021, USA was by far number one in uh, the number of private investments in AI. And I think that's about $50 billion just in one year. And so smaller countries such as Cyprus are unable to compete with countries like that. And as a result, we have this centralization of power in AI to just a handful of private companies. And so we have just a few AI superpowers who control the entire digital infrastructure of the world. And this could be likened to a new form of colonialism. But whereas historically, um, it was empires that were the colonial powers, now we have private companies. And these companies, the way they work, they've adopted colonial processes, similar to, similar to the ones that were used during colonial era, but they've also revived various um, theories and methodologies that were used back then, and they've been proven to be false, unscientific, but they're still being used. So I created this table just to show the relationship and to, so we can compare historic colonialism with AI colonialism. Um, so for example, the first thing here is AI, but also historically colonialism, they had this modernizing, civilizing mission, like we have to do it for the world, the white man's burden. Um, for example, I've added there a quote from the governor of Cyprus when Cyprus was a British colony. And this is how, this is in his mind why Cyprus had to be colonized. He said, we have duties for which a secure Cyprus is needed. Suez Channel is, only, is of vital importance. The prime minister himself had said that this may become a matter of life and death for us all. So we have to colonize Cyprus for the good of humanity. And in similar ways, AI is used you know, as a modernizing solution to fix old, old age problems and inefficiencies that we haven't managed to fix so far without any question, without any criticality. Um, and I'm not trying to downplay the atrocities and genocide and slavery that came with uh, historic colonialism, settler colonialism. I just want to show that a lot of the old issues uh, from history still continue to exist, but it just comes through new technologies. And AI specifically is a top-down technology uh, that is controlled by just a few privileged elites. Um, and then that has a real impact on human life, the way that AI is used. I'll go through a few examples now, but this is going to be part of the game that we're playing, so I don't want to talk about it too much. I'm, I'm hoping that we can uh, discover all that as we play along. Okay, so this is what interests me. What, what is the impact of AI colonialism on Cypriot society? Uh, there's a lot of research 
uh, about the ethics, the biases, the impact AI has on society, but it's mostly coming from a Western and specifically US perspective that's very specific to the social, cultural, political realities of those regions. So my questions are, how will Cyprus be impacted? Or is it already impacted? Is our historical legacy as a colony um, interlinked with technology? How about our, our current socio-political position? Um, the wider geopolitics of the area, how does all that feed in? And Cyprus, and specifically the Eastern Mediterranean, we, we're a hybrid in between region. So we're either categorized as West, you know, we're the birth of Western civilization and all that, but we're also considered non-West, Oriental, lazy natives, so depending on what is convenient at that time. So how does all that fit in? So one example I wanted to share was the colonial data extraction tendencies of AI. As I mentioned, AI requires huge amounts of data to train AI models. So why do we have this increase of availability of data? Uh, the majority of us are now using the internet, we're using smart devices, we produce data on a daily basis, we post photos, we post texts, uh, smart devices constantly keep track of our data. Um, so all that is being used to train AI models. Where historically colonialism exploited local resources for the benefit of the colonizer, now AI companies use our data for their profit. Um, so our data privacy is actually a big issue as part of all this. Um, web scrapers, which are these automated bots, uh, are being used by AI companies to extract data from websites uh, and use that data to train AI models. So for example, chat GPT, all these text to image uh, AI models, they have been trained to a big extent on data that has been scraped off the web. And this is an example um, I wanted to share with you, Clearview AI, which is a facial recognition company and over the years, they had collected more than 20 billion images of people's faces and data such as names, locations from social media platforms online. And they used that to train their facial recognition model. And this was then sold to law enforcement around the world and private companies as well. So anyone who has access to this system can use it to uh, recognize people basically and find personal information about them. And this was actually against GDPR rules and it was fined by the EU for over seven and a half million sterling pounds at the time. But <clears throat> it hasn't really stopped that it. it still goes on. And any one of us could have been affected if we post photos online. But to my knowledge, no local media here in Cyprus reported on this. Although well, it's quite a huge thing. Another example, uh, this is how colonial era methods and theory, theories are being revived. Um, this is a classic example of how machines can discriminate in harmful ways through the continuation of colonial era methods that have been proven to be unscientific. Um, so there's, for example, this colonial era method of the cr craniometry, where uh, colonial powers would measure the size of the skull of colonized people, which was supposed to provide very objective measurements of their mental abilities and intelligence of the colonized people, which has been proven to be entirely false. In a similar way, facial analysis also uh, measures facial features, um, and they claim to be able to identify gender, um, sexual orientation, emotions, and so on. But it's proven to also misidentify marginalized groups, especially if you're black and a woman, you only have about 50% chance 
which is, you know, um, to, to be correctly identified as the correct gender uh, by facial recognition companies. So how, how would Cypriots fare? Um, there's, this is an old article, but this company still exists. It claims to analyze people's faces to see who's a terrorist. So, you know, thinking about how the majority of Cypriots look like. So how, how would they fare if they had to go through this anti-terrorist facial analysis through, when they go through airports, when we go through airports? So there's this power dynamics at play. So it's a you're a terrorist if in the mind of the creator of the AI system, you look like a terrorist, basically. And it just perpetuates historical prejudice and biases that have been going on. And another example is this environmental exploitation. A very few entities benefit from AI while the environment and the wider society is harmed. So we have these power asymmetries here as well. Um, AI is a hugely polluting technology. Um, just to run systems such as ChatGPT uh, is forbiddingly expensive and it's incredibly polluting. So here, for example, it's been reported that just to train ChatGPT, it produced about 500 metric tons of CO2 which is as much as over a million miles driven by an average car. And it still is incredibly polluting to use it on a daily basis. And we use it as if it's nothing, but it probably costs millions and millions just to keep it up going. <clears throat> and also data centers, uh, where all our data is stored in uh, computers, they, they need huge amounts of water to cool them down constantly. So what is the impact on Cyprus? We're expected to be really badly impacted by climate change. We're a climate change hotspot, according to scientists. We're going to have extreme heat, water shortages, pollution. We're gonna be impacted by diseases and displacement of populations. So we, we will be impacted disproportionately while not receiving many benefits if the polluting AI technologies are, um, from the AI technologies, sorry. So this is also in a manner that reenacts this historical practices and imbalances of colonialism. And whose knowledge, whose perspective? Um, historically, colonialism imposed the empire's knowledge as universal. Um, generative AI today represents other cultures in incorrect ways. For example, that imposes the American smile on AI-generated images of people for whom the American smile is not part of their culture. And this is how stable diffusion depicts a Cypriot person, the image on the left there. And just to compare, on the right, you see what images come up when you Google a Cypriot person on Google image search, because generative AI models are mostly trained on data that has been scraped from the internet. And this is how the internet, which is mostly Western, depicts a Cypriot person that then transfers to AI technologies. And we don't have a say how we're portrayed and we don't have any power over it. Um, again, Google search, when you start typing why are Cypriots, the autofill is borderline racist. Okay, and then I don't know if uh, any of you speak Cypriot Greek, but ChatGPT, for example, does not recognize Cypriot Greek as a valid phrase uh, or a valid language because it's been, it has not been trained on data of Cypriot Greek. So we also have this not only uh, power imbalances between Cyprus and the world, but we also have this domination of mainland Greek and mainland Turkish narratives over local Cypriot ones. And that brings me to the AI colonialism board game, Cyprus version. So such issues and many, many more are, have inspired the game. 
And I'll present the game quickly now, just so you can get a quick idea uh, of what it is. Uh, and then I'll go through the instructions properly again once we start playing. So don't worry about having to memorize everything. So it's a collaborative board game. So we all work together. And it aims to raise awareness of power asymmetries in AI on a very local, separate level in a playful way. And I'm using decolonial and feminist approaches because they're very well suited uh, to examine issues of power. And it strives to empower local communities to be a bit more critical when using AI and when interacting with these technologies. So visually, it's uh, referencing colonial era games where we had these imperial fantasies of conquest. So this is actually, I had cropped the image, but on this computer it shows the wrong image. But expect a very exoticized, orientalized uh, illustration of a Middle Eastern person, possibly. So it's meant to juxtapose this historic colonialism with the present day colonial character of AI today. And I wanted specifically to use generative AI to create many parts of the game, to produce images through this colonial gaze of AI. So for example, that image there is meant to be an image of a Cypriot person wearing traditional Cypriot clothing, but instead it's produced this image that's very exoticized, orientalized, and it considers Cyprus and the Middle East as just one culture, basically. And this is the concept of the game. Cyprus is under AI colonialism's occupation. A few Western AI companies have centralized all power in their hands and control the global AI infrastructure. They push their own values and worldviews as universal without taking into consideration the rich diversity of experiences of communities around the world. They also exploit the global population and the natural environment for their own profit, from extracting internet users' data, to train their AI models, to mining raw materials in ex-colonies that are then used to build the hardware that run their technologies. And this is how it works. So you, as the players, you uh, have to collectively fight against AI colonialism by collaboratively collecting all fragments of decolonial AI to create speculative Cypriot AI systems. And the players must avoid having their data harvested by the web scraper who is trying to scrape all your data for big tech's profit. And to reach these fragments, you move along on the game board following the instructions of the player cards. And these cards will prompt, they give you various scenarios that prompt a collective reflection of how AI impacts local communities. And it also allows you to investigate the power asymmetries that exist both on a global level, but also thinking about the power dynamics within Cypriot society, because not all Cypriots or residents of Cyprus will be impacted by AI the same way. And once you reach a fragment of decolonial AI, you must then pick a speculation card and transport it to the home area to keep it safe, again, following the card's instructions. And at the same time, the web scraper is trying to get you to scrape your data. Um, and the web scraper moves around with his or her own web scraper cards. And if the web scraper reaches a player, then you have to lodge a complaint with the commissioner for personal data protection and wait for it to be examined. So good luck with that. And finally, when all fragments have been returned, uh, you reflect on this power dynamics mapping that you've created throughout the game. See if there are any patterns that have emerged. 
and then um, selects one or two of the speculation cards that you've collected throughout the game and uh, try to imagine what's, what a Cypriot AI system for the benefit of Cyprus would look like. And all of that will become part of the board game artwork. So all possibly, it will all possibly be exhibited together with the, with the data that is created throughout the game. Um, and that's it, black and white ones there. Um, and the players will move with those. And then once you reach a fragment of the colonial AI, you get one of the speculation cards. Um, and it's gonna tell you how much to move. It also has a question, but we're not gonna um, dwell on it now. We'll, we'll uh, look at it at the end of the game. And if for some reason the web scraper gets you, you have to lodge a complaint, GDPR complaint with these cards. So to start, maybe collaboratively, since there's just a few of us, we could discuss who are the various communities and groups that call Cyprus home? I have printed out some data from the previous census. It's from 2011, so it's not really up to date. But if you're struggling, you can um, use that if you like. And then write, write various groups that come to mind on these post-its. And perhaps we could place them, I don't know, here or there. And also think about the power dynamics that exist. There are communities that have existed here for centuries, but are not officially acknowledged as an official community of Cyprus. Um, there are also groups that have adopted Cyprus as a home, either temporarily or permanently. Uh, think age groups, gender as well, sexual orientation, religions, ability. I need to bring more pens. more here, but don't feel limited to these. Okay. To be honest. All right. As judging. I, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I'm I mean, really you sure can think about this. you can go towards eternity, right? There's so many groups, right. but we can start with maybe a few, and maybe more will come up throughout the game. Is that yeah. what you mean, or is it just something that makes you feel uncomfortable? Uh, uncomfortable. Yeah. Okay. Is, is, is the word for me. Yeah. I, I, by, by acting like I could say, well, I'll, I'll be a gay Jewish refugee. Mm. Oh, but you're not going to be one. But, we, I, but uh, I feel like I'm... Okay. But then I, then I play video games, mm -hmm. and that's much more fluid mm -hmm. with identity. I don't know. Okay. This is the problem with playing with, playing with the choir, I guess. Okay. <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir. Yeah. Know. 
what would you guys propose? Oh, I just wanted to ask, the, the impact of identifying all the groups, what is that on the game? Uh, so that's going, to, we're going to use that mm -hmm. while we're playing, and we're going to go through various scenarios mm -hmm. and see are some groups 